All set. Script for remotely conducted open meeting. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public from the meeting who doesn't use a full name or acts inappropriately. Let me introduce myself as Andrew Lowell, Chairman of the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Mr. Sidlowski? Here. Mr. Brace? Here. Mr. Bossy? Here. Mr. Franzuto? Here. Mr. Pronk? Present. Ms. Andrews? Here. For staff, we have Tara Riley? Here. Is anybody else with us, Mr. Brace? No. Oh, we got Kona. Okay. Sorry. Anticipated speakers on the agenda. If you wish to speak, raise your hand now. Otherwise, simply listen in. Good, good evening. This open meeting of the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have, been that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. <clears throat> Permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the via meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Harbor and Shellfish Advisory Board, Tuesday, November 16th, 2021. Do we have an approval of tonight's agenda, please? So moved, Mr. Chairman. This is Ginger. This is Tom, second. Okay. Motions made by Ginger Andrews, seconded by Tom Sadowski to approve tonight's agenda. All in favor, Mr. Franzuto? Aye. Mr. Bossy? Aye. Mr. Brace? Aye. And Mr. Pronk? Aye. Thank you. The chair votes aye as well. <clears throat> Approval of the draft minutes of November 2nd, 2021. Does everybody look them over? Any adjustments to be made? Please state so now. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Andrews. Uh, I think it, there was a, maybe it's a typo. Uh, there was a reference to the second, second tier. It's, okay. Are there two second tiers or just one? Have that noted, Peter. Second pier at Monomoy, and I put two seconds in front of it. Is that what you're saying, Ginger? Uh huh. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank, thank one you. Cap thank one capitalized, one not. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ginger. Anybody else? Not hearing or seeing. 
any, uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of 2021, uh, November 2nd, please. So moved. Second. Second. All right, Mr. Bossy has made a motion to approve the minutes of November 2nd. Ginger Andrews has seconded. All in favor, Mr. Sidlowski. Aye. Mr. Franzuto. Aye. Mr. Pronk. Aye. Mr. Brace. Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. Marine Department report. Do we have representation? Uh, we don't. Okay. Any comments from Marine Department? I'm seeing or hearing any natural resources report. Tara Riley, please. Hi, good evening. Um, so I have just a short report today. Um, everybody's obviously still, still fishing. I think there's about 10 to 12 boats that have been going out for the past two days. Um, I believe they're all getting their limits. Some boats are going for double limits. Um, the majority seem to be in second bend right now. And I'm sure you saw the newspaper article. We're still kind of working on the whole seed area in Madikit and evaluating that. Um, I think we have all the densities pretty worked out and we're just um, talking with fishermen and some other um, restoration specialists just to kind of see, you know, what they would do with an area like that, um, just to kind of take everyone's input um, before we make any decisions on anything. Um, but it is a substantial area. And I guess for the time being right now, we're going to monitor it. And um, because there is, a, you know, overwinter mortality is a, a real thing for Base cops, so we want to make sure that we keep an eye on them and, um, you know, check on them throughout the winter. The other thing we have going on, Jeff said to me that um, the request for proposals for the harbor plan update is due to come out the first week of December, and they will be probably looking for a representative from SHAB to you know, serve on that board and provide input um, as soon as we figure out what, what the plan is. So I'll keep you updated on that. And other than that, we're just doing a lot of maintenance um, for the hatchery and we get our algae in right after Thanksgiving to start culturing it for the 2022 season. So if you have any questions or I missed anything, let me know. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Mr. Franzuto. Hey, Tara, did you have a chance to take a look at that uh, eelgrass report? I did. I read it. So Dave um, was nice to send me a report from, I believe it was 2020 yeah. for their eelgrass research that they're doing on the vineyard. And Dave, I forgot to tell you that we were over there last summer and we actually got a chance to see the eelgrass that they're growing in the pots out there. And um, the report was really great because they do a lot of practical stuff and they also report things that don't work and lessons learned. So it's very helpful for people yeah. like us trying to get involved in, um, in eelgrass work. And so we are in communication with the vineyard and also the land council who's going to kind of head up the eelgrass restoration for 2022. And we will be using our tanks or a portion of our tanks this year for holding seeds and harvesting them um, to get them to mature for a little bit bigger of a mass planting um, this for next season. So it's something that we're looking into right now. We're trying to figure out like what the cost is to run, run the pumps for each tank and how long the land council might need them for and that that sort of thing, just trying to figure out what the what the trade-off is and the, the in-kind um, donations for grants and stuff like that. Oh yeah, that's that's great. I mean I um, I was talking to, I was talking to Rick Carney who's been involved in that Martha's Vineyard uh, shellfish group since since inception back in the in the uh, late 80s 
and he's been their shellfish biologist or he was their shellfish biologist for a million years and and he was kind of <laughs> trying to steer me uh, but you know it's one of those things you know we don't like to work with the vineyard but if they've already done a bunch of this work maybe it's time to work with the vineyard so um, I just thought it would be interesting and uh, and maybe a, a good way to to uh, to help us. I agree. Okay, perfect. And Mr. Chairman, one other thing, I, I volunteer to be the uh, Harbor Plan representative from Sheb. Okay. Yay. Keep, keep keep that noted, Mr. Brace, please. You're a ringer. A ringer. <laughs> You're the ringer. <laughs> they're, they're gonna end up making you do all the work that's okay that's okay i you know it's near and dear to my heart good we're uh -oh. glad you wanted to do it <laughs> um i looked at that as well thank you for sending that out dave uh i noticed in there that they also collect uh shoots that uh you know break free and wash up on the beach yeah. Uh, Tara, any opinion on the viability of that and and a value in uh, uh, try, trying to implement something like that as well? I mean, uh, I, yeah. I have always felt that eelgrass, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, uh, clears itself every fall. We see a lot of it wash up, of course, and it's kind of like uh, natural thatching, I guess. But uh, it, some of them always do look uh, spry and, and uh, transplantable. Is, is, that, is that the case? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it obviously depends on the time of year that it washes up. So stuff that washes up, you know, in the winter from winter storms or whatever isn't going to be helpful because um, the timing is just off. But I, I mean, a, a lot of times we do collect what's on the shore there. And as long as it's vibrant and green and has, you know, roots attached, um, it is, that's what we have been using for transplanting. I think it makes a lot more sense doing that than, you know, taking eelgrass from another healthy bed um, when you have free eelgrass on the shore, that's just as good. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think it's a very viable option to do. You, and also it's nice because you can have anybody can pick up eelgrass from the shore and deliver it, you know, to the right people. You, there's not a lot of people that can dive underwater and, and take up eelgrass. So it's a lot easier to engage the community and volunteers and in, in something like that. Like, like a seed stranding. Thank you, Tara. Right. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Board members, questions for Tara? Ms. Andrews, please. Yeah, um, I, I was interested to notice that they were <clears throat> adding coconut fiber for more organic matter. And I'm, I'm curious as to how that would work because um, at the CONCOM years ago, we had uh, discussions about uh, CLAR, which is the coconut fiber that they've been using for erosion control, but it, it, it breaks down in um, topsoil and dry land. And coconuts uh, uh, per, um, propagate themselves by floating long distances in salt water, so that the the lignin uh, doesn't really break down in salt water. So I was wondering how that would how that would turn out. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, the way I read that report is that they were mixing the coconut fibers in um, with, I think they were doing like a three to one, three parts of sand and one part of potting soil and then the coconut fiber for the organic material. And But I got the impression that they were just kind of experimenting with a few pots and it wasn't like a big wide scale experiment. Oh, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Yeah, definitely. Um, did uh, I, I don't know if it's um, if this is the place to ask, but I um, I wonder if anybody uh, else um, besides Mr. Brace and I attended the NBI um, uh, conference and um, and the workshop uh, on Saturday. I thought it was very interesting, and there was a lot of talk about uh, you know the dealing with eelgrass and uh, propagating eelgrass and and all that. Um, yeah. 
I was interested to hear about the um, the way that uh, uh, that eelgrass was fairly shallow rooted, that it only goes down a couple of two to three inches, and that um, uh, the part of the problem that we're having here is that there's so much nutrients in the water that it's feeding the algae that's smothering the eelgrass so it's not getting enough light um that was that was something that i that i hadn't realized before yeah that's true i think um i know emily molden had reported that the nitrogen is showing up in a lot of the other different species of macroalgae um, they were looking for it in the eelgrass and they weren't finding large amounts of, of nitrogen like they were expecting. And when they ended up looking at other species like Codium, and, and I don't know if they looked at Lingvia or not, but that's where they were out competing the eelgrass for, for the nutrients and then overgrowing and smothering them, like you said. Anybody else? Board members, questions for Tara, comments on natural resources report? Not seeing or hearing any. Thank you, Tara, for that report. Will you Andy. be able to up? Andy. Mr. Tim Brain? Mooney was, Tim, Tim was Tim. waving his hand. All right, public okay, I think I'm unmuted now, do you hear me? Yes. Hearing you, Tim, yes, thanks. Okay. Um, Tara, I was wondering, has anybody ever taken any soil plugs of a healthy eelgrass bed and compared it to other areas where it's not, you know, growing as well? Because that might give you an idea of what you're missing. This is true. Um, it has not been done since, I mean, as far as our department goes, we have not done it. And I, the only person that I would probably say has done work like that is Sarah Octe. I know that she was really into soil chemistry and that sort of thing. And yeah. so I, I would be surprised if she didn't have some information or data on it, but it's probably not current. So that, that is a good point and that would be worth looking at. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, because you got horse shed and really Matticate to pull from right mm -hmm. now for anything that's real healthy. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Thank you, Tim. Um, Tara, uh, I guess just to back up for a second to uh, the large bed of seed in Madiket, uh it sounds like, you know, simply to monitor it is probably the wisest thing to do at this point. Uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, you, you mentioned that you're looking for suggestions, which is wonderful. And thank you for including us in that. Um, uh, I just keep thinking, you know, with all these moving parts that we're discussing, whether it's sand, eelgrass, uh, stormwater runoff, the health of the harbor, fertilizer. I mean, the number one thing we need is is fresh water uh, to to support all of this habitat. And probably is it is it uh, comfortable to say that the freshest water is where these seed are versus say moving them all the, or moving some of them all the way to town or spreading them out to uh, the square in Tuckernock or, or something like that. Uh, it sounds like they're possibly in a safe place, not too close to shore in either direction or I'm not quite uh, figuring, I don't know exactly where this this is is it in uh warren's landing area so if you are going out of hither creek in the channel and you are in between the middle of madiket and the eel point area um it's it's right over towards the the middle there out right it borders the channel basically and so the area um, kind of goes over towards, um, towards Jackson. It's like a, I don't know, it's basically like a, it's a, a giant square. Um, and the part over near Jackson's point, the densities are around 20 to 25 scallops per square meter. And as you move towards Eel Point, they double. And, um, you know, there's, having 50 stops per square meter is an enormous amount. Um, so 
I would worry about um, them out competing for food eventually for growth, just because they are so dense. They also, um, they're not at risk for stranding, but I believe they're at risk for going into the channel. And this, it might not be like a huge deal, but it is pretty silty over there where they're like most concentrated. So I would say the majority are in the eelgrass, but there is like the top corner of it that they are in sediment. And I've talked to Steve Tettelbach a little bit, and he's the um, restoration specialist over in Long Island. And he said when he had some high density seed recruit in sand and silty areas, they did not overwinter well. And so that's why we just want to keep an eye on it. But I do think that there are some areas within that large area that are pretty darn dense. Um, and so I'm not saying that we need to like dredge everything up and move it. It's something that we have time to think about like in the spring, if we wanna just thin out just a tiny bit of it. Um, but yeah, I just, I would worry like they're just stacked, they're piled up. They're really piled up in that one area. Like they're probably six to 12 inches like off of the, the bottom. Like it's just, it can be very thick and they're not gonna feed and grow well when they're in that situation. But we have a lot of winter storms, you know, winds coming up, they could blow all over the place. They could thin out. A lot could happen. So, you know, like I said, we'll just monitor them and keep an eye on them. And so we have an idea of what we're dealing with going into spring. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. One more chance, board members, questions, comments. Mr. Brace. Uh, two questions. Uh, do you worry since you worry that the the current going between Tuckernock and the tidal current going between Tuckernock and um, um, Madigan Harbor will wash some of them out to the sound or maybe luckily over to north of Tuckernock or um, over into the ocean. And then the other question was uh, about transplanting eelgrass. And we all kind of know that eelgrass is really long and thick um, in, um, in Madigan and north of Tuckernock. And so if you transplant, transplant that into town, is it going to be that long? This is probably a really dumb question, but is it going to be that long when you transplant it? Or are you transplanting it when it doesn't have the long, long fronds? Sorry, a lot of questions. Um, yes and no. So there's different ways to trans, you're ta if you're talking about transplanting eelgrass and not seed, so we're talking about eelgrass now? Yeah, okay. the, there were there was the seed question and then, then it was eelgrass. Okay. So. okay. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter the length of the eelgrass. Usually when you take it from a donor bed, it's all pretty uniform in size. Um, so yeah, you just try to take, um, two or three clumps from each, you know, area and not try to like completely leave an area barren, but, um, we, I, nothing has been brought from Madikit over to Nantucket Harbor, vice versa. So like, for example, on Hussey Shoal, there's a donor bed. Um, adjacent to the area that they're transplanting on. Um, I don't know. And then we've collected from shore, but I don't think they've taken from like the horse shed and gone over to Hussey Shoal or anything like that. There's, you know, you definitely want to vary the genetics of your eelgrass is what I've been reading about a little bit. So you want to make sure that you have diversity within your eelgrass bed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franzuto on mute. All right, I'm just going to give my one anecdotal comment for the evening. Uh, 1975, in the area that Tara is talking about, 120 scallop boats on opening day. That's it. <laughs> I, I remember those scallops. They all had little white dots on the shells, didn't they? Yep, yep. They had, yep, they had little, yep. But 120, 120 boats on opening day, and she just reported she had 12 boats today. So it's yeah. simple math. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, Peter, Mr. Brace, one thing on the length of the eelgrass, according to the report uh, from the vineyard that, that Mr. Franzuto sent out, they when they're transplanting... Uh, shoots they they trim them down uh 
so so that uh, the plant can concentrate more on its root generation. Uh, anyhow, if there's nothing else with natural resources, we'll move forward. Are you waving your hand, Tim? Yeah, just a quick uh, comment. Uh, probably about 10, 12 years ago, Madikit was paved, like you're talking for number of scallops. What they ended up with was very small scallops. I mean, small in size. And then the meats were only so big because there was so many of them. And they could take one toe and get 10 boxes. But they're real small type of stuff because they, were, they didn't have a lot of food, like you were saying, Tara. Yeah. Just so you have an idea. Okay, thank you. Yep. Tara, we're glad you're there to monitor this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Old business, excessive sand and scallops, dredging plan. Um, Tara, is there anything new from, from Mr. Carlson on dredging? Um. I, it hasn't come up in conversation, so I don't have anything to update yeah. you with on that. All right. Um, uh, in the Mr. over Chairman? this past, uh, Ms. Andrews, please. Well, <clears throat> um, uh, the the first presenter at the NBI conference was a woman who uh, uh, talked a lot about eelgrass, and I uh, mentioned your idea of the. Uh, Archaeology uh, vacuum cleaners as a as a um, uh, uh, possibility to uh, thin the sand cover over the mud that would make that would make the um, uh, uh, nutrients more accessible to the roots of the eelgrass. And she said she hadn't thought of that, but it was an interesting uh, idea. And I can't remember her name. I'm sure Peter has a program, but uh, I I didn't somehow manage to get one. But uh, but she, her uh, research is ongoing, so um, uh, she was interested in possibly doing some research on that uh, idea. That's great to hear. Thank you, Ginger, for sharing that. Mr. Brace. Yeah, <clears throat> the entire conference day, which was. Um, Saturday, the, what was it? Uh, well, it was not this past Saturday. It was a week ago Saturday. Is, is, it's going to be on NCTV. We paid, um, we paid to have them film it. Um, it was a, the conference was a hybrid. So it was not only live presenters, but people presenting uh, via Zoom from wherever they were. First time we've ever done that. And I know that we were recording it. So, I think in addition to it being on NCTV, it is also gonna be on our website, which is nantucketbiodiversity.org. So you should be able to go to that. You should be able to still go to the website and find the schedule and find the person's name and then, and then watch that and then maybe connect with her. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Thanks, so, Peter. Mr. Brace, or I'm sorry, Ms. Andrews. Oh, I was just uh, uh, saying thanks for that. I, I actually, um, the nice thing about the conference was that there was time between uh, sections to actually chat with people. So, um, so I did share the idea with her. It wasn't part of the uh, presentation, but I did uh, mention it uh, and during the break to her. So that's. That's how it came about. So it, it isn't. It won't really appear probably on the videotape, but I did yeah. uh, mention it to her. Well, thanks. Uh, you you raised some awareness. It's, it sounds like it sparked some interest, and uh, you know we're just uh, we're just throwing some jabs out here to hope to uh, uh, save our habitat. That's really what this is all about. Is as far as I'm concerned, and I think I'm speaking for the rest of you. So thank you, Ginger. Um, so I, I reached out on uh, this past week to Mr. Tim Mooney, who's here with us tonight, and also to uh, Phil Osley. Uh, Phil's unable to join us, uh, but Tim did join us just to uh, uh, 
kind of give us uh, his view on what he sees on the bottom. Tim is a commercial scalloper. Uh, he's retired uh, Coast Guardsman and uh, he's been diving uh, our waters here, namely the harbors, uh, uh, for probably three 20. decades or more. Yeah, 20 years. Okay, two Just decades or a little more. 20 plus, yeah. And uh, he's seen some changes and, and uh, has an opinion about the, the sand as well. Uh, in my speaking with Phil Osley, uh, his main concern uh, is, is uh, fertilizer, um, the nitrogen loading in the harbor, seeing all the lingbia, smothering the eelgrass. Uh, he was quite passionate and uh, uh, a little, you know, actually quite a bit of excitement in his voice that uh, we really need to do something about uh, the fertilizer use, he, he really feels in his years out there that uh, as more and more development has taken place around the harbor and more and more rich green lawns have uh, popped up, that uh, it coincides with the degradation of the harbor. And uh, uh, I've also spoke with our shellfish warden, J.C. Johnson this past week, uh, we talked a lot about stormwater runoff and the outfall pipes into the harbor, how far away a lot of this comes from, how much uh, mulch and, and ground up leaves ground up by cars running them over, ending up uh, you know, out there as well. We've got a lot of biodegrading material. Uh, his, his thoughts were the entire storm drain system ought to be connected to the town sewer and not dumped into the harbor anymore. Uh, a noble plan. Um, but uh, uh, as we all know, there's not any one silver bullet. So I think we should be looking at all these uh, thoughts and ideas and taking them into consideration and considering some type of recommendation at some point uh, in a, in a direction to move with with several of these moving parts, but anyway, um, uh, board members, any comments? Anything new you'd like to add in this uh, uh, section? Our excessive sand Mr. and solids, the dredging plan. Who's that? Uh, Stringer, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Andrews, please. So <clears throat> I know that the. Um... The land bank is working. At, I I just want to preface my this is that um, some years ago the um, uh, sewer department did a lot of uh, putting smoke up of up the sewer pipes to try and um, get stormwater runoff out of the um, sewer system because it, the sewer system was being overwhelmed with. Stormwater, and uh, in the old days, one of the practices was to connect the downspouts to the sewer. So, um, so that was uh, that was it was just a, a huge volume issue even even then. Mm -hmm. But uh, the land bank is working on a plan for the whole Lily Pond Park area to uh, uh, try and be able to deal with some of the runoff that goes through that and to change the pipe that goes to the harbor into more of a natural stream with uh, checks along the way that would uh, uh, and vegetation that would help remove some of that, slow the flow down and, and remove some of that um, uh, excess fertilizer. So uh, the, uh, you know, combination of various uh, permeable pavers and changing uh, changing the, um, you know, the method of delivery there. Um, uh, we're not the only ones concerned about it. And uh, I haven't, I, I was supposed to meet Rachel this morning and somehow I forgot I was on deadline and I got a little bit behind in my work. So um, maybe she'll forgive me and I'll get a chance to uh, meet with her later. But uh, I thought that was a, uh, um, 
a really uh, um, interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ginger. For any other board members? Um, Mr. Mooney, would you like to share with us what your eyes are seeing as, well, um, as, as a commercial scalloper that dives? I can tell you what it used to look like, but that's not really going to help you because, I mean, you're dealing with what you have today and trying to keep what you have and, and get more of it and grow more of it. So um, what I'm seeing is you got the green crabs, you got the conks, um, you got the little uh, boring uh, snails that are killing them off. I've seen the sand where they will actually roll into a small hole and as the currents are going, the sand will actually cover over the scallops and kill that batch right off. I've seen areas like you're talking about, uh, Tara, where the where they're out in Connecticut, where it goes, um, seed actually go into that channel and then gets covered up by uh, dead eelgrass, just stagnates the water and then all you have is shells next season. Because I thought this would be a great place to go. I went there and nothing was alive anymore. So that's other things is the storm will take that grass and cover them up. The sand will cover them up. Um, you really got to get keep that stuff from shifting if you can. But the eelgrass is also giving you that nutrients you need for it to grow if it's in that area. They're talking about um, taking the sediments um, up harbor, while when at harbor, that's got sediment and mud in there that's probably a good, I mean, it's knee deep or deeper. I've stood in it before and, you know, my feet go right up to my knees and in, in mud out there. So the deeper water, the 14 to 16 feet of water, that's where you get, you have a lot of nutrients that are down there if you're gonna transfer anything because there's nothing there but mud. And I mean, it's the bl nice black fertilized, you know, like stinky mud that everything loves to grow in. <laughs> so, but yeah, I took you out one time and you saw how it changed from, you know, just a month where yes. they've been out, uh, you know, dredging and all of a sudden where there was grass and crabs and, you know, conks, all of a sudden it's just sand and little tiny stubs of eelgrass, you know, so. Well, I was even wondering, it, it didn't even seem like eelgrass. There was a strange looking red, uh, almost like dandelion weed that was probably every five to eight square feet and uh, just kind of seemed like uh, a sandy desert with little hollows the scallops made for themselves to hide in and, and these little red weeds that didn't seem to be contributing to anything. But uh uh, I didn't look with a uh, magnifying glass to see if, you know, anything's clinging to that. Uh, I'm sure there is that, that it's, they're beneficial to, but not anywhere near what an eelgrass bed uh, benefits. So, I've seen, uh, um, I have seen seed in uh, Nantucket Harbor there that is about the size of a pencil eraser up to, you know, dime and quarter size. Not a lot, but it is, there is still actual, uh, um, spat out there and small scallops. It's just that they're not in large quantities. So at least there's something there that will produce spat next year and, and the ne year after that because they're so small. So, but yeah, it's a matter of possibly just closing an area. I mean, I got no problem with it. I mean, it just means it's going to help out. I mean, you'll probably get a lot of kickback from it, but that's something you that may have to be considered is just close an area down or look in an area and figure there's what you have for percentage of eelgrass. Say you got a football field full and only half of it's actually um, eelgrass. When you lose somewhere around 35 to 50 percent of that, close that area off because it's just going to go. You're going to lose it if you let. Uh, everybody continue to go in there all season long. You know, it's like um, you mow your lawn when it's raining out, but I get 15 people in there to mow your lawn at the same time and then come back the next day. 
you're going to have a mud hole. You won't have grass left anymore. So you, you're looking at sediments that are loosely on the surface and you start moving it around and stuff, the tides are going to, just going to take it away. So something to think about. I know it's a hard decision and it's, it's a difficult one too because there's a lot of factors involved in jumping through different hoops, but maybe in the long run, something that is going to have to be done. So. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Board members. Yeah, I'd like to say something. Mr. Prong. Yeah. Um, the area basically what Tara is talking about is if you took a line from Jackson's Point to Smith Point and then went from the channel, it'd be almost like the letter, like the letter D. It's the middle ground of Madigan Harbor that she's talking about with the mouse concentration, like towards like the northwest corner of it, like like you would be heading towards Tuckanuck you know, over towards the Eel Point side. There's nobody working out in the middle ground. Um, on a big day, there's four boats working in Mattaquit and everybody's so spread out, but nobody's basically working in that area anyways, because I don't think there's anything in there to work on. And there's so much seed, it's not worth towing in there. I don't think it's worth closing the area because um, we're kind of self-regulating it out there right now, I would say. I don't think there's any adults in the middle ground to work on. So nobody's going to go in there anyways. So that's, that's my thoughts. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else? Questions, comments, Mr. Brace. So because it's, we're, um, because we, we are entering the colder part of the year when we can, or of the, we could potentially damage the seed, but it doesn't make sense to dredge out um, the areas um, near where Mr. Mooney is talking about that fill in and make it cover up and eventually kill that seed. It doesn't make sense to move seed um, within Madigan Harbor or to Nantucket Harbor. Um, I'm just wondering about that. I, I got something to comment on that, Pete. Uh, that good, Mr. Brace. You want to hear from Mr. Prong? Sure, and then Tara. All right. We moved a lot of seed, and Tara, you can come along with me on this. Was it two years ago from the channel going into uh, Pulpus Harbor? We we moved, God knows how many bushels of seed out of there, and I personally dumped pretty much every load I moved. Sometimes I take two cowing boards full. In the, into the horse shed. And I don't think any of that lives because I went back and looked around and and I don't know, you know, moving seeds, I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but I have always thought let mother nature take its course. If stuff washes up on the beach, of course, go move it. But I don't know, that stuff we moved out of the channel there, I don't think that did anything. I could be wrong, Tara, you know better than I do, but I don't think anybody benefited out of that. It was... I think it was a big waste of time. It probably would have died in Pulpus Hobble Channel, absolutely, but I don't know. I, I, I'm not a big fan of moving seed like that. You're messing with Mother Nature, and I don't know. That's, once again, that, that's my two thoughts. I think, um, I mean, I think that we are, and I think there are some advantages to moving seed. I think, like, as the fishery declines, um, seed management becomes important. Um, especially when you have like a large seed set, like we do in Madikit, there's, you know, you don't have to take a lot, but you can thin, I, I guess, thin it out and put it in some areas that might be used as a spawning sanctuary. You know, you have a lot of, you know, different areas that might, might help create more of a population for the following year. Um, I, you know, I don't like disturbing seed either, especially this time of year, you know, they're going dormant now, they're not feeding, um, you can stress them out. But I think in March, you know, after we see where the winds kind of blow everything, if we decide we wanna move a few of them because they're in the channel or they're getting ready to fall into the channel, or like Tim said, you know, there's dead eelgrass smothering them, you know, maybe that's an opportunity to kind of look at, at what we have and, and make some decisions then. 
Thanks, Tara. Mm -hmm. Bye. Board members, anything else? We were in old business. We'll move forward to health of the harbors. <laughs> Uh, excessive lawn fertilizer use. Uh, I just heard today, Tara, uh, clarify this for us, if you will, is uh, Joe Manella proposing a home rule petition to ban fertilizer. Yeah. Joe Manella, as a private citizen, is yes. proposing to ban fertilizer. Okay. I just found that very interesting to hear uh, at the last Admiralty Club meeting, uh, Mr. DaCosta, a previous board member here at SHAB, Bob DaCosta, uh, sent me that link uh, I sent to the board members. I'm sorry, anybody else does not see that at the moment, but it was basically about uh, restoring heath grasslands uh, and I think he was relating it more to Mr. DaCosta was thinking about doing an article about fertilizers as well, but something more towards uh, encouraging people to use more natural grasses than the grasses we're seeing today requiring all this fertilizing. Uh, so that's why I, I hadn't actually, I sent it out to all you guys before uh, I even looked at it. I thought it was related more to fertilizer use, but uh, it can be if you put it there. Uh, so, uh, and I spoke with Mr. DaCosta this morning. Um, he's uh, uh, interested, you know, in sharing information with us. He's very concerned about the health of the harbor, uh, the nitrogen loading. Um, and stormwater runoff, all, uh, everything that we're talking about, he thinks is, uh, you know, all the moving parts that we need to work on uh, to try to make some improvements. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to get a handle on and on being able to do that. And I uh, applaud Mr. Manella for going out as a private citizen and doing this. It's, it's, it's not, not easy. So, uh, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll follow this and see where it goes. Board members, uh, discussion on excessive lawn fertilizer use. How do we support that fella? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dan. I'm in. <laughs> and, uh, if there's nothing else, we'll move forward. FDA shellfish taking prohibition in mooring fields. Anything new to discuss in this? Not seeing. I don't anything. have anything. Oh, go ahead, Tara. I don't have anything new, but I just wanted to remind you that I think I said it mentioned at the last meeting that they opened the horse shed out to Holbert, but it is set to be closed May 15th. So that's the deadline that we're working with. And we had a meeting on Monday um, with NRD and we talked about getting all the materials and everything ready to submit a proposal um, by the beginning of January to the DMF. So we have time to work with them until the May 15th deadline, trying to figure out how we can keep all of these areas open. So are you saying that DMF is already planning ahead to next May 15th to close these areas again? Um, that's what the notice said. Wow, that's interesting that they can project that far ahead. Uh, I guess based on, on the past, they can do that, but uh, I find that interesting. But, but Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Franzuto. They're, they're, they're only basing their information on numbers of boats that will yes. be there suspect mm. po possibly on May 15th. Mm. It, it's it's not science based, it's boat numbers based. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, mm. they've got to we yeah. we've got to make a strong case that Nantucket has always uh, uh, dealt dealt with the sewage issue more than any other community on the East Coast. Mm. Also you gotta you gotta Tara, I guess you got to remind them that we're a federal no discharge zone since 1993. 
I, I don't know why that doesn't carry any weight. I, I don't well, know yeah. why they don't, they don't look at that and go, oh, well, Nantucket, they're clean, or more or less. And well, also, um, as I understand it, we are meeting or we are below our TMDLs, our total maximum daily load yep. for our harbor, for the amount of pollutants that go into the harbor. That's another thing to, to, to bring up. Dave? Yeah, that, that's ex Peter's exactly right. It, not, not the, the, don't, the, the problem with the federal no discharge zone is, is that, you know, I very proudly say that, but now most of Massachusetts and the communities around Nantucket Sound are included in a federal no discharge zone. So it doesn't carry as much weight that it does only be, because there are so many other communities, but the date is important 19, since 1993. So it's not like we just started this. Like I've said to people a thousand times, we haven't been sitting on our hands. And Peter's other point is extremely important. We're one of very few communities that are meeting or beating the TMDL. So that's that in itself, that one point right there should carry the day. And, and also we, you know, we was it now four years ago, we, we, we rebuilt our jetties. We filled in all the holes. The Army Corps of Engineers told us that that that, that particular project was in the worst condition they'd ever seen of any project. And so we 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 filled in the holes. We restored it to a half tide jetty, and the computer models said we increased our tidal flow by three quarters of a knot. That's another thing exactly. to say to them. Exactly. And. And then I can't stress this enough. We got to find out which boats are going where that have the heads. So we could show them on a map and say, look, here are the boats and they're all over in this area or we're going to move them out of this way. So that so well, they're, can... they're, they're primarily in the, in a, in a general anchorage. What is it in the, at the town pier or at the boat basin? Um, but, you know, is the, the Jetty's restoration project probably the best project I think I've ever worked on. And to be able to increase the tidal flow in and out of the harbor on two tide cycles a day at three quarters of a knot is moving a lot of water. So uh, again, that, that, that notwithstanding, that's another piece of the puzzle that should go in our favor. And, and just to add to that uh, three quarters of a knot and how much of a difference it makes, uh, in talking with Phil Osley the other day, he said uh, that the, the current is so strong, he can't, it, there's an area there at Halbert Avenue, I believe, where he uh, would train people in diving and uh, the tide's moving too strong for to do his training there anymore. He said he's he's uh, seen a huge change in 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 how much the, the tide is moving. Uh, Andy, Mr. Pront. I mean, what about what about Dave? You might have some knowledge on this. That, that Caratuck barge was here a couple of years ago, right about now. You know, they they hold out how many metric tons of sand out of the channel? That must yeah, have 40, been. 40, yeah, that 40, must have been forty. 45,000 cubic yards, yep. Yeah, I mean, that must have increased the water flow immensely as well, too. I mean, yep. certainly yep. didn't, you know, it, it, it didn't prohibit it, that's for sure. <laughs> no, and the deal the deal I had with the Corps was they would rebuild the jetties and they would dredge, but that I couldn't ask for anything for another 10 years, but that's, <laughs> that's okay. That, that, was, that was a $10 million project. That, that, we got a good deal on that one. <laughs> yep, yep. Thanks, Senator Kerry. No. <laughs> well, all right. Um, <laughs> Peter and Dave, great points. Uh, I see Tara was taking some notes there. Uh, I, for whatever this is worth, I had mentioned at the last meeting that the NSA uh, is interested in contributing monetarily to uh expanding water quality testing um 
so I, I don't know if that's a resource that can be tapped into as well to to uh, strengthen the case for keeping this area open by uh, uh, getting some funds for uh, for some some increased water quality testing. Um, because as I said, the NSA is certainly interested in seeing more testing done and they're, and they're willing to spend some money on it. They're willing to grant some money. So uh, anything else on this subject? The FDA shellfish taking prohibition in the morning fields, not seeing or hearing any. Water quality testing update, boat holding tank, die tab distribution. We kept this on the agenda. Uh, Sheila informed us at the last meeting about the die tab distribution. Um, if there's anything, we just touched on some water quality testing on our last subject, but if there's anything here, anybody wanted to discuss any more, we kept it on the agenda for this meeting. Now's your time to speak up. Not seeing or hearing any, we'll move to new business. Coastal Resilience Advisory Board, do you have an update, Mr. Brace? Only that um, the Coastal Resiliency Plan is f formally finished. Um, it will be presented to the Board of Selectmen on December 1st. We've written our letter to them, uh, perfected that, and uh, um, now begins the process of, um, I believe, um, uh, FinCom started meeting on, you know, capital requests today, I think. And I know that at least Matt Fee, who was on the, the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee, was there making his case for certain things. So the process of doing the early um, recommendations, getting the money that begins today, so don't have much of a report, but. That's Thank okay. You. Thank you, Peter. Questions or comments for Peter? Not seeing or hearing any. Okay, so we put this on last week at my request. Uh, Harbor Shellfish Advisory Board sponsored town meeting article, which we can't do, but we can at least make a request to, to the select board or whatever board uh, would be appropriate uh, to possibly do uh, an article on something that makes a difference, such as uh, some uh, uh, stormwater runoff regulations, uh, improvements, uh, in talking with Phil Osley the other day, or actually before I mentioned that, uh, I don't know if any of you saw some pictures from that. Uh, the, when we got the, uh, we all got the warning about a, uh, a tornado. And during that heavy rain event there, we didn't get a tornado, but we had some heavy rain and some people uh, posted some pictures of Easy Street flooded uh, around to just about Young's bike shop. And it was the streets full of rainwater. Uh, and it wasn't salt water coming over at Easy Street. The tide wasn't high. Uh, so, I mean, and basically what we were experiencing during that was uh, so much mulch and leaves uh, clogging up catch basins, uh, even though I've seen our sheriff out raking the leaves out of off the catch basin grates uh, and kudos to him and his assistant Richard Harrington for doing that uh, whereas the DPW has been shorthanded but when all these leaves get run over they turn into dirt uh, underneath car tires so quickly and and uh, the mulch is pretty much already dirt and Phil Osley had mentioned that uh, kind of the same thing that Mr. Mooney had mentioned earlier that the, the silt and, and uh, uh, nutrient loaded type soil, so to speak, the fines are so heavy in Easy Street Basin, he basically loses his legs from the knees down in, in this uh, silt that's in the Easy Street Basin as he uh, 
possibly sometimes wades out to his boat that he keeps there versus rowing out to it because it's so shallow in there. But uh, I mean, it, it's a product that simply can't be good for, for the harbor to constantly be washing all this mulch off of all these beds in town and uh, letting it constantly flow into the harbor with whether it's a, a flood event, which uh, had taken place, uh, you know, several weeks earlier and all the mulch from take for instance the new easy street park simply washed off into the streets into the harbor and uh, the mulch ends up getting replaced and it all happens over again and over again as a cycle and i'm not looking to uh you know for for immediate action here but i'm just hoping to inspire the board as uh, uh, Mr. Bossy mentioned at our last meeting, some areas that he noticed that were inundated that could certainly use some stormwater runoff improvements. Mr. Sidlowski mentioned that there are areas of the island that really don't require uh, stormwater runoff improvements because there aren't problems there. And I understand that. So that means kind of fine tuning okay, what areas do we want to uh, take action? What areas are most priority? Uh, so I'm hoping simply to inspire some thought process from the rest of the board, uh, come together somehow uh, with, some, with some thoughts that make sense that can be turned into an article or turned into simply a recommendation that this is how the board feels that some action needs to be taken uh, in this area, whatever that may be, whether it's, you know, fertilizer use, stormwater runoff, uh, anything to do with the health of the harbor. So uh, uh, I have not personally as a private citizen submitted any uh, citizen articles this year as much as I wanted to do something on stormwater runoff uh, both Mr. Bosti and Mr. Sidlowski convinced me really that you know this needs to be well thought out and and uh, uh, and and proposed as as a viable plan so uh, um, any thoughts from board members uh, I, I'd love to keep these, keep this on here and have ongoing discussion and try to move forward with, with some plans that, that action can be taken from. Thanks for listening. Any comments, Mr. Sidlowski? Yeah, Andy, I think, I think it's a good idea, but and the one thing I wanna think about is what's the distance from the water that we ought to be thinking about. Because I think is if we look at our mission and everything, if we came up with a distance, I don't know, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's how many feet or a quarter mile or 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 shorter, what's the distance from the water that we want to try to capture the runoff to keep it from going in? And I think if we could come up with something like that, I think we could make a recommendation to the select board that they start considering that. And it might be, in addition to that, certain areas of, of the island, but we could, but the whole water, you know, the whole coast of the harbor, of both harbors, uh, makes sense as long as we're, you know, within a proper distance. I don't know what the distance would be. Well, Tom, uh I can understand you thinking that way. And it's kind of like Conservation Commission has a hundred foot. Uh, their jurisdiction is measured 100 feet from edge of wetland. Uh, but when it comes to stormwater runoff and you think about, uh, you know, I use this as an example a lot. Take for instance, the little parking lot on the corner of Pleasant Street and Silver Street. As far as I know, that the storm drains from up there as far as Pleasant Street go down to uh, Consu Spring, uh, from as far as Fair Street, Orange Street, Union Street, 
are all dumped down into the outfall pipe that's either in front of Sale Seafood. Then there's yeah. another outfall pipe at Francis Street Beach where the kayaks are rented. Then there's another outfall pipe uh, that is at uh, the town pier area. Um, and, and even like the outfall pipe at Easy Street. Uh, and also there's an outfall pipe that is fed by the pump at Children's Beach, but the outfall pipe is at, in front of the Yacht Club for that one. We're, and, and Ginger mentioned earlier about uh, the land bank in Lily Pond. Uh, Lily Pond takes in uh, runoff from, take for example, Woodbury Lane. Water runs directly down the street from Woodbury Lane to Lily Pond. And Lily Pond has a dilapidated pipe that they're intending to improve that goes all the way to Children's Beach. So to be able to measure and have an actual foot amount of distance, I think is difficult for us. We need to, we need to look more at areas that we know the runoff is making it to the harbor from. And, but, and if, but, if you go all it, the way, go ahead, Tom. So what you're, but here's the, the situation. So if you're talking about not having runoff water go in, you're talking about closing all of these places where the runoff water it's, goes in and sending it no. to the thing, which, no, no, which no, no. but, but so, so what's the difference between saying that, that the water that runs all over on Washington street that ends up somehow getting into the Harbor, it, it, if it's all going to end up in some sort of a, an inlet pipe anyway, I don't know where you're, getting an answer unless you stop water from being piped into the harbor. I mean, it's going to be piped into the harbor. If it, 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 I don't care where it comes from. If you're, if you're going to let a pipe in the harbor, those pipes are going to flood if, during if, heavy if, rains. And if more, if in. more, Tom, if more private homes created their own on-site recharge systems, right. we could eliminate a lot of this runoff by filtering it through ground on site. Um, I realize the outfall pipes need to be there, but we as individuals, I feel, can do something uh, more proactive to keep contaminants from ending up. I mean, if we're, if we're over fertilizing then excess fertilizer is running from as far away as Woodbury Lane and Pleasant Street all the way to the harbor. So if we could somehow cut down on this fertilizer use, then we're getting less contaminated water going into the harbor. If we can create more filtration systems for this stormwater runoff before it ends up in the harbor, uh, maintain the filtration systems that are already there, like the one that was created during Mr. Franzuto's term in front of Charlie Sales's the Sales Seafood. Uh, I, I mean, when's the last time that's been maintained? There were a lot of a lot of infrastructure was put into that area. Tom, you were probably not here when that was simply yeah. a big, huge dirt parking lot where people pulled their boats out and scraped their barnacles off and repainted their bottom and then <laughs> just dragged their boat right back into the harbor from, from there. Uh, Mr. Franzuto. Yeah, there, there's, 52, there's 52 discharges, direct discharges into the harbor. And the, the, the areas that feed those are enormous. The, the one of them that Andy's talked about starts up here by the high school, up by my house. Yeah. And and ends up down by Great Harbor Yacht Club. Yeah. That and and so I mean the so here's my here's my recommendation. I, I'll talk I'll I'll send a if the if the board's approval, I'll send a recommendation to Carlson or a, a request to Carlson to have him make a presentation as to how these storm as how these storm water watersheds are set up and then maybe we can pick and choose which ones we could we could deal deal with 
uh, on an individual basis rather than all of them, all of them from Great Harbor Yacht Club all the way around to Brand Point. So uh, that's just an idea. But they're, they're very well mapped. Uh, they're 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 so well mapped that we had an oil spill on w- behind one of the buildings on Upper Main Street, and we're able to put a plug in the drain at Easy Street before the oil got there to block the oil. So my that's my point in that is is that they're very well they're very well mapped, so we know. We know where they are in the areas that they cover, but I, I think we need to. I think that I think we'll find out that there are some that are more problematic than others, and those we could focus on. That's just an idea, Mr. Bossy. Dave, can we get access to those to that map? I was just looking on Map Geo where they have the sewer maps and electric utilities were all mapped out, but they don't have a storm sewer overlay. No, there's no, no. I've I've seen it. It's 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 old, old, old paper. I uh, don't know. I I don't know that it's. Uh, I'm looking for a pen to make myself. We need know. it digitized. Yeah. Uh, let 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 me let me uh, let me wind up some people about that, and uh, uh, I'll see what I can do on that. I've seen it spread out on a table. It's like five foot square. Um, yep. but, but let me, let me find out about that. And, and I think, I think that maybe Jeff could give us some insight on the problematic areas that we should, that maybe we could focus on. That's a good plan. That's where I would suggest starting to be with the, understand the map a bit and then pick and choose. And, and work backwards. It does yeah. make sense. I, I like that idea. Uh, Mr. Franzuto, and uh, thank you for making some notes and 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 reaching out on this as well. Uh, uh, and Mr. Sidlowski, I just wanted to get a, a little bit understanding of where I'm coming from. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I think it's been a good discussion. I, I appreciate it. All right, and I it's mean, helped me a lot. You well, you've you you know kind of make me think harder when you. Uh, you know, question this. So I really appreciate that. And, and, uh, I'm glad that you're all on board and engaged and, and listening because, uh, uh, I'm watching stormwater runoff, uh, and, and it's just sickening to me at the job sites that, uh, even though they have no concom jurisdiction, the silt that I'm seeing run off from job sites, uh, it's just blatantly disrespectful. Uh, it seems like a seminar is needed for contractors to, to understand what how their impact is spreading so much further away from their job site than, than they could ever realize. Uh, I mean, the more silt that ends up in wetlands that are there to absorb and filter uh, the silt turns into like a pancake batter, and now it just allows the water just stands on top of the soil, and 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 doesn't get a chance to go through and filter. Mr. Franzuto, but to to the job site discussion, where do where do we stand on the stickers for the dumpsters? Wow, and that's that's great question. Uh, they uh, they know we've approved of the design, and uh, at the last meeting they were so focused on uh, a new grant system uh, to help people out that want to get into the industry. They uh, they were talking about granting uh, money to a Dylan Wallace that's intending to build a a up-to-date modern scallop opening shanty that would be well I, but, I, so that i did not get an update on the stickers and and but, uh but, but I didn't I, have I, a, go I, ahead I, I can appreciate that and you know i know dylan wallace and i know his mother and father but you know all that aside if you don't deal with the things that we're dealing with right now Mm. literally on a weekly basis talking to Tara and the efforts that these people are making, mm. he, he's going to have an empty shanty. 
because he's yeah, not right. going to have any scholars yeah. to open. <laughs> That's a good mean, point. I don't mean to. Thanks, I don't mean James. to be this way, but no, you know, you're right. Just you know, come on. Let, yeah. Let, these All right. Are, the stuff that we're dealing with is on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the next meeting's the first first Monday of, of next month, so I'll, I'll be sure to, to uh, try to get that ball rolling. Thank you, Dave. Please, please. Andy. Thanks. I know, because you're going to help me go apply them all. <laughs> Damn right. Damn right I will. Hey, Andy. Yeah. Who is it? Uh, Mr. Mooney. Yeah, um, just this last storm, I actually drove down there myself. A lot of this water was also coming as far as from Academy Hill. So I think what you're looking at is mm. elevation mm. and the direction it's flowing. Mm. I'm pretty sure it's coming from the cliff too at the same time. Yes. So yep. and then it ends up down Easy Street right down there. And mm. you're oh, it's, a, it's, a a it's, it's a massive amount of area uh, yeah. that runoff comes from. Yeah. So yeah. so maybe another idea would be to try to map that out and 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 uh, draw some lines on a map where we feel the runoff is coming from that ends up directed towards the harbor. So because like you said, the other side of Academy Hill goes to the lily pond. But then the lily pond ends up yeah, going right to the there. harbor. So right. so so the line continues past Academy Hill. Um, anybody else? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Andrews, please. Oh, yeah. I, I just, um, the, the watershed is a, is a pretty complex thing. I, I don't know how much mapping of it the Land Council has done, but the, you know, there are, uh, there are wetlands that have you know, been kind of developed around and, uh, you know, some of these uh, flows have shifted. But, you know, above the lily pond, there's, you know, Grove Lane and the wetland there that goes all the way to um, uh, Crooked Lane. And then there's the horse paddock where, of course, there's uh, uh, puddles uh, during heavy rainfall. Uh, there's also the intermittent stream above uh, lily pond that goes there's sometimes a large uh, puddle in um, Coffin Park. Uh, you know, the, its days as a baseball field have, uh, have changed a bit. Um, and so that can be swampy. And um, the, then you're right at Cliff Road, as Mr. Mooney says. Yeah. I mean, when the health department drew up the map for, for uh, septic and, and whose septic is is flowing towards the town. That's one kind of map, but uh, uh, I, I don't think it helps us like like stormwater runoff. Uh, it needs its really needs its own map uh, for for I, for better education for the public to understand. I'm sorry. I'll fi I'll figure that one out. Okay, you're taking on big responsibilities this well, week. Well, I I may uh, be I may be I may be wrong but I think that, that the watersheds are delineated on that storm map, or at least as Mr. Mooney points out, who I want to also comment that he's a fellow Coast Guard warrant officer. Um, uh, they, I think the watersheds are either delineated or to Tim's point, the elevations are, are delineated so you can be able to figure out the watershed relatively simple. Tara, I imagine if you were aware of a map of this sort, you'd uh, you'd be letting us know. Any thoughts yeah. on a watershed map, it's particularly that could help with stormwater mapping, stormwater runoff, and it's it, where it comes from and where it goes. I I do have a a stormwater map. I think it's a little dated though, so I would want to like double check and see if there had been any improvements. Um, since since then. Okay, Mr. Mooney. Yeah, Dave, this is kind of for you and everybody. Um, my son, Sean, he works at the wastewater treatment plant. And I guess they're supposed to start taking over the storm drains. And oh, he has are. a pretty good idea of the maps and where a lot of this stuff goes right now. He's been at it for a couple of years. So you may right. want to get in contact with Sean. Well, yeah, well, and you, you, you fire. 
you fire them up and send them my way. I can do that. <laughs> right. Thank you. I know you yeah. can. Yeah. And uh -huh. um, ladies and gentlemen, I got to get some sleep. Got to be up for a couple hours to work. But thank you for letting me uh, sit in and listen to this. Very thank educational you. and interesting. Thank you. Tim, thanks, thanks for joining us. Yeah. I have, to, I have to go cook dinner, Mr. Jim. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're at we're at uh, recap or items for next meeting. If there's no uh, public questions or comments, uh, uh, I will accept a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Uh, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay, the uh, motion's been made by Mr. Bossy. Seconded by Ginger Andrews to adjourn tonight's meeting. All in favor, Mr. Franzuto. Aye. Mr. Brace. Aye. Mr. Sidowski. Aye. Mr. Prong. Yes, sir. Hey, Dan. Chair, <laughs> chair votes <laughs> aye as well. Uh, I'd like to just mention our next meeting is December 7th, which is three weeks away from today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tara. Good Thank you, Tim. Good night, Good night, board members. Good night. Over and out. Good night, everybody. Thank you.